This podcast is sponsored by Underdog. Want to make money making picks on MLB games? Then you have to try Underdog Fantasy, the easiest place to play fantasy sports. In Underdog's Pick'em game, you just pick your favorite baseball players and predict whether they will go higher or lower on stats like strikeouts, hits, and more. Pick to two to five players, get all your picks right, and you can win up to 20 times your money in a single night. Be sure to sign up with the promo code PITCHERLIST and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100 so you have some bonus cash to start playing with. Again, that's UnderdogFantasy.com or Underdog Fantasy in the App Store. Sign up with promo code PITCHERLIST and get your first deposit doubled up to $100. Must be 18 or older, 19 or older in Alabama and Nebraska, 21 or older in Massachusetts and Arizona, and present in a state where underdog fantasy operates. Terms apply. Concerned with your play? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.ncpgambling.org. In Arizona, call 1-800-NEXT-STEP. In New York, call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY. In Tennessee, call 1-800-889-9789. How's it going and welcome to episode 132 of On The Wire, a proud member of the Pitcherless Podcast Network. Follow the pod on the Twitter at OnTheWirePod. You can follow me at 80 Grade. that's all spelled out. You can follow Kevin Hastings at HastingKevin and with me once again is Kevin. Kevin, how you doing, man? How's the stretch run? We only got two weeks to go. I don't know what else to say. Like that's... (laughs) Yeah, no, no, it's amazing. And, and like we talked a couple of weeks ago, it seems like it, we talked about usually, at least for me, and I know for a lot of people, we get into those dog days and it, it really seems even more of a grind. And we know it is a grind, a, a long fantasy baseball season, but th- this season has flown by for me. And now that we're down to two weeks, that's just even more <laughs> the case at this point. And not only fantasy, but just the baseball the pennant races themselves are exciting. There's a lot going on. We're still getting call-ups as we keep talking each and every week. And it's just been a blast every all season. It hasn't slowed down. <laughs> yeah. At least one. Yeah. the I think we're all guilty of this. And I don't think it's really innocent versus guilty at this point in the season. But you also know that if you play in multiple leagues, this is September is the time in which it's okay to start, you know, not paying attention to the team, the leagues that you're not doing that great in. And you start, you still have the same amount of focus. The same amount of focus is still put on all of your leagues, except now it's being squished down to if you're doing 10 leagues, maybe now you're focused on six of them. And so the same amount of energy that you were putting into 10 leagues is now being condensed into six or less leagues. And for me, it's definitely like that right now. And I'm putting the same amount of energy, but it's just like squished into these like two to four leagues. And it's, it's hurting my brain. (laughs) Yeah. For me, it, it's maybe not as much as I'm, uh, Putting any less energy in Mm -hmm. some of the leagues that I'm not doing as well in. However, uh, when I sit down and whether it be putting in uh, lineups for the weekend in NFBC formats on Friday or fab on Sunday, I start with the leagues where I am contending just in case something comes up and I have to step away for a second away and I end up and I forget to come back and I miss a deadline those leads are being taken care of Mm -hmm. first. I think I'm still putting the same amount of time in the others, (laughs) but I'm definitely changing the order of priority that I work on things. All right. That's fair. That's fair. I am going on, uh, on record and saying that I am definitely not paying attention to the teams. (laughs) I know I'm going to be in the bottom third. I'm sorry. And you know what? I know there's people out there that are, that would actually appreciate that as well. you right. It's like there, you, we see this Twitter talk all the time. It's, hey, if you're in the bottom third of your league, like you shouldn't be putting in bids on fab. Like you shouldn't be playing spoiler. And then there's the other side of things. Just, no, you should be playing hard. Like the competition is the competition, regardless of where you are in the standings. I get both sides. I'm telling, I'm, I'm just going on record right now. The te- the leagues that I'm in, where I'm in the bottom third, I will be in the former camp. <laughs> so if you appreciate that, then there it is. Um, if you don't, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I think that we. Oh, yeah. I was just gonna say, I think it, it is an intriguing conversation. Uh, the the only time that I really get bent out of shape at all is if somebody hasn't been paying attention for mm. months. 
and they still have 950 out of a thousand dollars fab left. And all of a sudden they're a Yankee fan and Jason Dominguez comes up and yeah. Oh, bam, $500 on Jason Dominguez. That's when it starts throwing their the weight around way. for no reason. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have any problem with guys at the bottom. Some guys could have been putting in lineups and making fad bids all season long and they're still at the bottom. It's sure. just been a bad year. Keep fighting, right? There's, they probably have a thing in their head. I'm not going to finish last. Now I want to get to the top 10 and they're still working. That is awesome. But if you've, if you forgot about your team for months and then all if of a sudden checked you out in July, one thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's when you don't get the uh, check back in September. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right. We do have some news that we need to go over. We do have two more, well, three more, three more fab periods of, of the regular just season. Two. We, we two, only got two weeks to go. Yeah. Two weeks left. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, two weeks left of the season with two more fab periods because the last day of the season they do it is on Sunday. There are no more one game 163s. That won't happen. They have all the tiebreakers set, all that. So we won't have to worry about, oh, I wonder if we're going to get a game 163, which would have in the past has counted, right? Especially in the NFBC formats on the Roto Leagues, that 163 counted toward the standings. And I don't remember what year it was, but there was a year where it like, flowed over and you had to consider that another fab period and so that was fun if you spent all your fab one, the week before and then you had nothing the first year i was in one of my home leagues this is years ago it was the year that david price pitched one game 163 for the rays against the texas rangers in arlington and i went to the game and our our league was still up for grabs with that game going oh sure and yeah, uh, yeah it was <laughs> And there were several things that, that mattered. It was David Price, how he pitched that day mattered. Stolen bases were still cut into play for both of the guys contending. It was really cool. I'm, I'm waiting for those rare rainouts in September that doesn't get replayed, right? Like we just saw Colorado and San Francisco rained out. Obviously, they can replay. They're in the same division. They end up playing each other often. And obviously, it was at the start of the series. So that was easy. Yankees Red Sox got tr- rained out twice <laughs> and obviously they get to play because they play plenty of times but but if they weren't like there's always that chance that game's like you know what we don't care the, neither of these teams they've both they've all been eliminated that doesn't matter for the standing that doesn't matter for playoff run we're not going to make it up and you're like I just I lost yep. any possibility of stats from those games and I can't I'm not making it up that stinks so we'll see if we get one of those but none so far they're pretty rare all right, lead right into one of those teams that doesn't matter. If the game gets rained out, they're probably not making it up, and that's the Angels. They made some additions and, and subtractions. First and foremost, they add David Fletcher and Jared Walsh back to the Major League roster, and ultimately, they're just taking the place of Mickey Moniak and Mike Moustakis, who both hit the IL on Friday after their own injuries, basically kicking them out of the rest of the season for the two weeks that we have left. But as far as Fletcher and Walsh go, Kevin, are there any? Is there any interest in there down this last two week stretch? Assuming they stay in Anaheim for all two weeks, and there's no guarantee on that. Yeah, I don't think so. I, I just don't think I'm interested in this lineup other than the top. <laughs> of the- yeah, I, I think it's gotten to that point. Especially, I feel like Otani is going to be shut down any day now. It keeps being it's a daily thing so far. I'm surprised at himself, but, and I. I I, I would guess his agent is probably on him. Like, yeah, let's just call this good. Let's call but, it a day. <laughs> yeah. I, and so it's just not a lineup other than the near the top that, that I'm interested in right now. The one thing that has been appealing to me while Shohei Otani is out. And if he is going to continue to be out, is Zach Nito is hitting second in the lineup. Now, that's something I am interested in any lineup. So that's the one thing I'm looking at. If Otani continues to not play and Nito is going to hit second in the lineup, that that is a move I would make where he's available. But I don't think I'm interested in the bottom of the lineup, which is where Fletcher and Walsh will be. Yeah, that's fair. Definitely on those two. I talked about Kyron Paris last week as, as a mm-hmm. speed option. He got sent down for, I think, one day and then got called right back up. And he's in the leadoff spot on Friday against the lefty. 
as opposed to Noah Schnuel, who had the day off on Friday. He's batted leadoff against lefties in the past, so I'm not sure that this is like any kind of little platoon situation. And ever since I recommended Paris, I did bring it as a caveat that Paris needed to get on base to steal his bases, right? Everybody knows that's how it works. He has not collected a hit all week and thus also did not get on base, if I'm not mistaken, either. And so he has not had the ability to, to steal any bases this week so far. But if they are going to provide him with any kind of leash at the top of the lineup and he can show some kind of life, that's somebody I'm at least considering if I'm still considering that if I'm if I'm really tight in a stolen base race, that's literally what Paris's calling card is. As long as he can get on base, he will record some stolen bases for you. So Paris is at least oh, a name absolutely. I'm looking at in that line. He had almost fifty in the minors this year, unfortunately. For fine, it I think. Appears, yeah. yeah, it appears that the Angels face all right handed starting pitching this week. So we'll see how that turns out <laughs> like i said chanel's bat li- uh, he's been batting lead off between lefties and righties either way so i'm assuming this was just like a routine day off and paris was just the, the got the benefit of that so i don't necessarily think that this is going to be a regular thing for paris but the fact that they even put him up there at all shows that they at least want to force this kid to actually show us what he can do. All right, let's go to a team that actually matters, Kevin, or at least what they do matters as far as the playoff race goes. Tampa Bay Rays, they got back Manny Margot from the IL as well. They sent down Vidal Brujan to make room for Margot. Assuming, should it be an assumption, especially with Tampa Bay, like Tampa Bay, San Francisco, these are like these teams that we don't expect any kind of playing time regularity with anybody beyond their the top talent. Do you think that Margot needs to get like regular playing time in this two week period just to get warm and get ready for the playoffs? Or do you think they're just going to continue to timeshare it? They do have him in the lineup Friday versus a righty, but I think for the most part, he's going to be in the lineup against all lefties and then a third of games versus righties or so. Mm-hmm. So it, rather than just getting a third of the playing time, maybe he gets about half, but with two weeks to go and it, every spot in our lineup, we're looking to either make up ground or protect categories. Uh, I, I, I don't know that half of the playing time is going to be enough and for a short side platoon guy, even somebody like Margot that probably will get more than the playing time just versus lefties. Uh, I think they're, they're more than happy to let Luke Rayleigh play center field uh, when there's a right handed right hander on the mound. Most of the time Friday, they do have versus a righty Margot in center field, Luke Rayleigh at DH. But I, I think most days versus righties, it's probably Luke Rayleigh in center and Margot starting out the game on the bench. I thought it was interesting that the corresponding move was to send Bruhan down, who's obviously not playing the outfield, not taking the same position as Margot. I would venture to guess Margot's going to play more often than Bruhan was, at least starting games. Bruhan literally only started five games since getting the call up at the end of August. And so I, I'm, I think that, What I'm seeing out of this situation is that Taylor Walls maybe plays every day now at shortstop. He was getting a couple days off rest since coming back from his injuries, maybe just to keep him, keep that oblique a little bit more healthier. Maybe they feel like he's healthy enough to play every single day. That would be nice if that's if you're relying on Taylor Walls to get you some speed or maybe a couple extra hits down the stretch, possibly. Uh, Bazaby gets a couple of extra days in the middle infield as well to make up for Bruhan leaving. But on the other side of that, I'm assu- like I said, I'm assuming Margot plays more often than Bruhan does. He probably takes away more time from Rayleigh or from anybody else in that outfield that he's going to be. Harold Ramirez is yeah. probably going to take a bit of a hit here. And he's probably, he's batting average is about uh, all he helps us in. So, and so mm-hmm. he's only an interest in, deeper leagues and of course ale only where anybody that's starting is worth a look but yeah once you get to 12 teamers and and down i i don't think there's um, a big effect here uh i i would guess some people probably are using harold ramirez or have been uh for the batting average boost 
Uh, he had the pinch hit home run 15, today, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, he can. So yeah, he got in there even without the start. He got a rest. He may take a hit, but if he gets in and hits a home run as a pinch hitter, it, it all counts the same. Counts right? the same amount. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you just can't get. You can't count on it. Exactly. All right, more IL returnees staying in the AL East here, Kevin. The Blue Jays they get back their starting third baseman Matt Chapman. I think a lot of Blue Jays fans would question whether or not he should be the starting third baseman based on what he was doing up until his stint on the IL. And it's easily argued that he was probably playing through the same injury, his middle finger all swollen up and, all, and what have you, but seems to be better now. He was hitting off the high velocity machine. He was doing ground balls. He was doing everything he was supposed to do. They returned him from the IL on Wednesday. He started and batted sixth both on, on Thursday, excuse me, he came back on Thursday and on Friday, he was in the starting lineup again. I'm expecting him to be the everyday third baseman for the Jays. It's still Matt Chapman. He wants to be out there. He's a free agent. He needs to get his stock back up when he hits the free agent market. Is there any chance in the last two weeks, we see some kind of spark that we saw in April where he literally was like the best player in fantasy baseball for at least a two week period. I think we, could see cl- at least close to the production in the pat- power categories. He had five home runs and 21 RBIs in April. I think he could, we could see that pace over the last couple of weeks. We're not going to see a 384 batting average uh, ever. Hopefully, we don't <laughs> see the 197 that he's had in August either. Maybe closer to even 220, 230 if, if we're looking for power help. But I think if you have him rostered, you're running him out there if you need power. If you're if you're protecting batting average and you're good in home runs and RBI, I would probably sit him. Yeah, 0 for six in his first two games back, which I'm not terribly surprised. I have him in my home league. I have not activated him off the IL yet because I haven't had to make a move yet. And yeah, it's going to be tough to make that move in a head-to-head playoff scenario where I'm just not sure what I'm going to get out of that roster spot. By the time you're listening to this, I will have had made my move. I'll let you know how that works out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Again, all this news coming from the AL East here. We'll go down to Baltimore now, who they're the team that makes the prospect debut for us to talk about this week. Number, if I'm, yeah, I don't have a look. I don't know. If, number two overall pick in, in his draft class, Heston Kierstad makes his MLB debut for Baltimore. As we're recording this on Friday, he got his first career hit on Friday in the form of a no hit breaking up home run. That's going to be some kind of class of his own situation. I'm waiting for the tweet that I haven't seen yet from somebody like Sarah Langs or somebody out there who can look this stuff up like nobody's business. And like how many players have made their career, their first career hit was a home run that also broke up a no hitter. Granted, it was in the fifth inning. It wasn't like the eighth inning or ninth inning home run, but it was still, sorry, it was in the sixth inning, if I'm not mistaken. But still, like, it's still impressive. So anyway, he's up. Baltimore has not been shy with bringing up prospects throughout the course of the year. Jordan Westberg, obviously Gunnar Henderson started off. Colton Kowser, a whole bunch of other ones. Gunnar Rodriguez on the pitching side, obviously. So some of them have gotten some everyday playing time. Some of them got a little bit more leash. Some of them a little bit less. Some of them it's like, all right, you know what? You're not the core. We're not going to give you as much of a leash. We're going to send you back down or we're going to give you every other play at any time. What are your expectations with Chris Dad going for the last two weeks of the season? As Bubba pointed out on the First Pitch podcast, he's not currently eligible for postseason roster unless there's an injury. Um, during the playoffs, then he could be called up. But as of right now, like if the playoffs were to start today, he would not be on their roster. So he's not a st- in that core per se. But I'm assuming Baltimore is going to want to see what he can do. How much playing time are they going to let him do it with? The playoff and roster eligibility scenario is intriguing to me here because I, I think a couple of days ago, we all thought Ryan Mountcastle was going on the I.L., and he hasn't. So I really wonder if they're saving that move, right? If Ryan Mountcastle goes on the IL and what the timing of that has to be to make Kirstad eligible for the postseason, that may be what they're thinking here. You because guys, I think I most assume people that, assume that Mountcastle was going on the IL a couple but of days if, ago. 
and if he somebody has, goes on the IL, the 15 day IL that carries into the playoffs, right? So if you go on to the IL, say the last week of September, I, I, carries I think it's into a couple playoffs, more right? days. So we're recording on September 15th. The season ends in 16 days from now. So he's got to so go on the IL. Maybe they got to wait. Maybe they got to wait a couple of more days. Oh, right? I see. that's what I'm saying. That I think maybe they're that Mount Castle still is going to the IL. If he doesn't, then I don't know how much playing time Kerstad's going to get. That's where I'm going. Mm-hmm. This is all about, I think, how bad Mount Castle's injury is and the fact that they may be manipulating time here so that Kerstad is eligible to take his spot on the postseason roster may be in play. I don't know this, but I think as. If Mountcastle gets back in the lineup over the weekend, then I'm probably not interested in Kirstad at all in Fab this Sunday evening. If Mountcastle's out all weekend, completely different story, especially if he continues to break up no-hitters with home runs. <laughs> <laughs> if he does that a couple more times, then yeah, we'll all take notice. All the all those players who checked out in July, all of a sudden they're checking back in September just to place bids here. Yeah, it'd be interesting if... This move that he was made wasn't made because, like you said, Mountcastle didn't hit the IL. So there's actually like almost like a dead roster spot, which provides Kershad and everybody else a clear path to playing time for Baltimore. If Mountcastle, one, either gets in the lineup, like you said, or goes on the IL, you got to assume that they'll make a corresponding move for that, assuming they'll bring in another bat, which would then also muddy the waters for playing time. So... It's like, can't win the situation. It's like only way Kristaps wins the situation is Mountcastle is hurt enough to not play, but not hurt enough to go on the IL. Right. And I think that this sounds absolutely crazy. Depending on what happens over the weekend, what news we get on Mountcastle and such. But I really think Aaron Hicks probably like has happened over the past three games, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday in the starting lineup. And he's played well with Baltimore since coming over from the Yankees. He may be actually the one to look at, and he'll be a lot cheaper than Kirstad on Sunday evening. Absolutely. All right. Last thing again, I got. I was debating whether or not we bring this up or not, but since we've hit on pretty almost every other AL East team, I might as well just cross this one off the list as well with the Boston Red Sox losing their closer Kenley Jansen, who tested positive for COVID. No exact timeline on when he may return. And I would speculate whether or not he returns at all, just based on where the Red Sox sit in the standings, where they sit in you know production, everything. He's on a two-year deal. Maybe they just let him rest the rest of the way. I don't know. I haven't heard that. Otherwise, this is me just speculating as a fan. With that being said, Chris Martin, he's lined up to be the closer in the meantime. He was lined up to close out the game, the matinee on Thursday. And the Red Sox scored three runs in the bottom of the eighth, putting the save situation out of reach. Martin still threw 20 pitches and closed it out, which is obviously not a safe situation there, but would have been ready to go. Is Chris Martin's got to be somebody that's going to be speculated on in fab just because this is, I think they're above 500. They're still technically a winning ball club. (laughs) They're not going to make the playoffs, but. Them and the Yankees are tied now, each a game over 500. And Boston's got 12 games over the final two weeks of the season at Texas for a series that's still playing for a playoff spot. Then they get the White Sox for three in Boston. And then two more playoff teams the following week. They get a two game series against Tampa and then four at Baltimore. So I, you know, I don't think Boston is going to just stop playing guys right they're they're gonna keep playing even though for all intents and purposes they're pretty much out of it with 15 games to go if you go 15 and oh the team you're trying to catch that you're seven and a half games behind has to go seven and eight which is more than possible but you're not going 15 and oh every (laughs) game both those things have to be true (laughs) is one less that the other team has to win so even if you go 13 and two now we're down to only now we're down to only having to win 40% of your games playing 400 mm-hmm. baseball for the right. team that's ahead of them. So they're out of it is what I'm saying. So I agree with you. I don't think we see Jansen. 
the fatigue. We know that that as, as one of the symptoms of COVID and, and recovering from COVID, I think they shut him down and say, get a, get an early start on rest and we'll get your throwing program going. Maybe we'll start your throwing program over the winter a week early because you're getting an extra two weeks off now. And that, that's what I expect to see. And I do expect to see Chris Martin over the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Jan- Jance has also had a long history, a uh, well-documented history of heart issues. He exactly. rarely pitched, if ever, in Colorado for that reason when he was with We've the Dodgers. We've seen him struggle traveled. down the stretch mm-hmm. in seasons in the past. So you, I got to wonder how- It just how, makes way too much sense to let him sit. I, w- I would just wonder too, how would how is COVID going to impact that pre-existing condition yeah. that he already has? Because- not even going to speculate, go down that speculative road. I wish him the best in the the most recovery possible as quickly as possible, but I do worry about that in, in general. Chris Martin. All right, Kevin question, Chris Martin, two weeks left, Chris Martin with the Red Sox or Trevor May with Oakland. I knew that was going to be, it's, it's gotta be, well, this is just dropped in one of my home leagues and he has just been sitting off. He's been uh, uh, not on waivers. He's just a free agent for three days. We're in the playoffs. No one's touching him, (laughs) but people need saves. So like, this is a situation we keep, I keep bringing up. It's like sometimes the, a better pitcher who happens to be the number two on a good team is actually more valuable than the set closer on a team that will barely ever give them save opportunities. So Chris Martin seems to be the set guy there on a more winning team. Trevor May is the set guy there. Hasn't gotten a save, I think, in a save opportunity in the last like week and a half. If you got a bid on both of these guys, who's higher on the waterfall bid? I ooh, it is really close, uh, and it shouldn't be. It would be Chris Martin, but due to the schedules, we just talked about Chris Martin's schedule. They have three or four three game series. Three of those teams in the playoff hunt. Oakland has a three game series versus Seattle who obviously is in a playoff hunt and their offense was scuffling a little bit after their red hot August. Now they've won four games in a row playing better again. Then they get four games of Detroit in Oakland. Detroit's been hitting better recently. They're still Detroit. They have a three game series at Minnesota and at the angels. We just talked about the angels lineup. I might give Trevor May a slight nod here. One extra game and not as tough of a schedule. Although I would prefer Chris Martin if I was managing a baseball team. I think over these (laughs) final fantasy two weeks, that might be Trevor May. A lot more things you have to consider, sure. (laughs) Yeah. All right, we'll talk about other possibilities. Yeah, (laughs) other possibilities you might be bidding on in that category and more. But first, we have to take our first break. All right, we're back. You're still listening to On The Wire, of course, with Kevin Hastings and myself, Adam Howe. We'll get into some fab recommendations in a bit. But Kevin, we got two weeks left of 2023. You know what that means. Draft season is around the corner. (laughs) It's here. It, yeah, ultimately, like, obviously, we, we heard the other guys doing uh, their very early, the what was the first nine rounds, seven rounds of, of a seven DC? Seven rounds of a DC, yeah. Yeah, Rob put that together, and a lot of guys are having a lot of fun with that. We are already talking about putting together our 2024 listener leagues, and question came up, like, how early can we get this done? Derek was kind enough to respond over at NFBC, because we will do the listener leagues again, and they will be on NFBC. As soon as they uh, flip over the ca- calendar and turn on the draft champions for public view, they can get our league set up. So we are looking to do a league, Kevin, as early. He didn't give us the date, but I'm hoping by October 15th, we'll have one up and running. As long as NFBC has already flipped it over, it should be good to go. Question is, and we put this out on Twitter, we had some requests. Should we've done 12 teamers strictly the last two years? Should we do one at a 15-teamer route, at least maybe this first one, see how it goes? Or should we just stick with our standard 12ers? What's your instinct on that? I think we went from, we had either four or five listener leagues the first year we did this. I think it was five. And in 2023, we have 10. Mm -hmm. I would expect that we could probably bump that 
to 12. And so I, my thought is let's do a little of both. Let's do maybe a four 15s and eight 12s. And obviously they wouldn't be in the same overall, but we don't pay out prizes for the overhaul anyway. It's just for bragging rights. NFBC is amazing in the the payouts on satellite leagues such as this very low amount that they take out, but we give it all to the individual leagues, which is amazing. I think, or maybe even yeah, you know, 12 team leagues are more popular. Maybe we could do two and still do our 10, 12 team leagues and do a couple of 15 team leagues. But I love the idea of doing a 15 team fab league in October. I, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> we were talking about this nice. um, off air right before we started, but I have every plan of my 2024 season is I have every expectation that I'm going to do the majority, if not all of my fab leagues in the fall, <laughs> fall and maybe into the winter and then focus on my draft and holds and then other types of leagues in, in, in March. Just, I, it just makes sense after when I think about it more and more, it just, it maybe I'm just convincing myself, but like the ability to make up for the mistakes made in early drafts on in the first week of fab, where as opposed to the draft and holds, you're obviously you're doing your research. You're, you're looking into guys, but you're throwing so many darts, especially in the last 20 rounds uh, that I, I like to be able to make up for that. And I can still throw darts, right? You could still throw darts in the last five rounds of a fab league. If anything, you might be able to throw more darts because you just feel like you have more flexibility the first week of the season to, again, make up for that. Spend that money, spend the fab early if if you feel like you can manage that fab budget throughout the course of the year. So, yeah, I'm excited to do a fab league in October. As simple as that. What's Let's just really quickly, Kevin... What's your initial instinct? You're, are you going to do a draft in uh, um, Arizona when you go to first? I always have. I, mm-hmm. I'm sure I will. I did. I've done the auction there a couple of times, and I did the, a draft and hold last season. The draft and hold is interesting. You you only draft the starting lineup, so the first 23 out of 50 rounds, mm-hmm. uh, and that was fun as well. I'm sure I'll do one. I haven't decided which one yet. <laughs> Now, when you do that, when you do that one, I I think we talked to Dave McDonald about this on the side. Are you going in blind? Are you just like going in for the fun of it and just doing it? Or are have like, have you already started strategizing to, <laughs> to have a strategy going in based on what we've learned out of 2023 so far? I at least take a look at what, what I think most teams starting lineups are going to be and, and look at what I think some playing time is going to be. But do I have a whole big spreadsheet of projections as I'm going in there? Absolutely not. A little of both. And I think um, a couple of things that we typically see in early drafts like that, the who we perceive to be the set closers go off the board much earlier What's fun is when you're doing an odd number of rounds, right? So we were drawing out of a hat for draft position. And for the most part, it goes 15 to one, right? Because right. the 15th is going to get the first pick when we finish the draft a few months later. And there's going to be That's the best somebody. Spot. Yeah. <laughs> there's going to be somebody out there that is obviously the one guy either that got forgot about or things have changed and they become the person you want. Mm-hmm. So it, it almost goes 15 to one in, in draft order preference. And, and that's fun as well. But yeah, I, I think I do think I will at least do a little more than I have in the past. Maybe at least put away, put together like a three year weighted average projection for players and then adjust it for what I think the playing time is. I would in, in the past, like I said, I've at least went through lineups and, and looked at things to see what we're thinking about playing time. But I think I might at least try to have some sort of projections put together. This is before most projections come out. Steamer's been coming in out earlier and earlier every year. Todd Zola for the past several years has put out his master's ball projections by November 1st. And this draft will be like on November 4th. So maybe just send Todd some money and, and, and get his projections <laughs> and go in there. 
And that's probably the smartest thing to do. But yeah, something along those lines. I think I will have some sort of projections this time. And I haven't in the past. Yeah, it didn't click with me until you just said it. But if the, if Arizona Fall League, if the first pitch is happening November 4th, like you will at least already have our draft under your belt. So you'll have, right. <laughs> we'll have that going for it, which will be nice. I think the thing I'm most curious about is to see where, what kind of adjustments people make with the rookie, with the prospects this year, especially based on what we saw this year, not only with the guys like Corbin Carroll and Gunnar Henderson, who came up early in 2023, sorry, 2022, or they came up late, excuse me, got their cup of coffee, got their sub 40 games in. And, but also the Jordan Walkers of the world who fought their way through spring training into the conversation of making the opening day roster and then shot up 50, 70 picks or even a hundred picks in drafts upon the news. You have guys that made their, they're making their debuts in September or late August this year who have the ability or the expectation of already being on the roster. So it's like they're already built into the ADP, right, as ADP gets collected. But then you have somebody like, I'm eyeballing Jackson Holiday, who shot up through the Baltimore system, is in AAA right now. I totally expect him to do a Bobby Witt Jr., Jordan Walker situation where he doesn't get called up this year in September. Obviously, not really enough time for that. They already focused on Kershed. he I expect him to fight his way through spring training, possibly even go to the Arizona Fall League as well. I don't think those rosters have been announced yet, but I would expect him to fight his way through spring training into an opening day roster conversation, if not actual com- like actual announcement halfway through spring training. I want to know how he's going to be, him and others like him are going to be impacted in early drafts, obviously long before spring training comes around. Um, and if people are just going to jump the gun, assuming that kind of conversation is going to happen or not. Yeah. And then remember we're, when we're out there in Arizona, we're attending Arizona fall mm-hmm. league games Oh, yeah. in my draft last year at the Arizona fall league, the talk of the league was Matt Mervis and he went in the 15th round. So that <laughs> He probably didn't go that early until we started thinking he was going to make the opening day roster. He moved up a little bit, I think, but I I don't think he's uh, someone like that would go in the 15th round of any other draft if we weren't there watching him play. Yeah, sure. (laughs) That's fair. Kevin, I will say we'll see what happens in October in our draft, but I will be very disappointed if you don't walk out of your draft in November without Cole Reagans. I'm just going to, I'm just going to say it. That's the I'll question. How high do I have to go? We're already <laughs> hearing hey, this. This has come up on all kinds of podcasts I've been listening to recently. Oh, I'm I sure. heard, Oh yeah. The winds of above, above fantasy guys are talking this week and last week about how high does he go? We've seen tweets from everybody, but the numbers I keep hearing are, top 40, if not top 30 starting pitcher, that's putting you, that's putting you in close to, if not just outside the top 100 picks overall in a 15 team league, we're talking top seven rounds. What do I have to do to make sure I walk away with him in Arizona? Go fourth or fifth. That's round? where Kirby, that's where George Kirby was going last in last year's drafts. He was going in the the upper nineties, mid nineties ADP. George Kirby so hasn't had two Tommy Cole John Reagan's, surgeries. Does that's he have that same he. kind of hype? <laughs> yeah, knock on wood, not yet. <laughs> so two is better than one, the, right? Or two. that's my only hesitation. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd say, yeah, I'm a Royals fan. I'm going to go grab Cole Reagan's in the fourth round. But two Tommy John surgeries. That's the worry. Is the word, especially when he's still pumping 100 from the left side. I think that Cole Reagans has been talked about enough. If somebody even thinks about calling him a sleeper going into 2024, I, I will stop that listening to him. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's long gone. <laughs> All right. We'll keep an eye out for our impending announcement on when we will uh, launch our, our 2024 listener leagues. They will come as, as quickly as Derek will set them up. I was, <laughs> I'm going to put it that way. And I think we are leaning to the first one will probably be a 15 teamers just to spice things up a little bit. Uh, but I am agreeing with Kevin. I think that a mixture of the two throughout the course of the off season uh, would be nice. Maybe we just alternate and we just fill as we go and we'll see which one fills up fastest and we'll go from there. But 
we still have to finish out 2023 before we do that. So the 2023 has two more fab periods. We got some players that we still need to spend whatever money we have left on. So let's get into some of those recommendations. And we're going to do that after this break. This podcast is sponsored by Underdog. Want to make money making picks on MLB games? Then you have to try Underdog Fantasy, the easiest place to play fantasy sports. In Underdog's Pick'em game, you just pick your favorite baseball players and predict whether they will go higher or lower on stats like strikeouts, hits, and more. Pick to two to five players, get all your picks right, and you can win up to 20 times your money in a single night. Be sure to sign up with the promo code PITCHERLIST and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100 so you have some bonus cash to start playing with. Again, that's UnderdogFantasy.com or Underdog Fantasy in the App Store. Sign up with promo code PITCHERLIST and get your first deposit doubled up to $100. Must be 18 or older, 19 or older in Alabama and Nebraska, 21 or older in Massachusetts and Arizona, and present in a state where underdog fantasy operates. Terms apply. Concerned with your play? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.ncpgambling.org. In Arizona, call 1-800-NEXT-STEP. In New York, call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY. In Tennessee, call 1-800-889-9789. All right, we're back. Let's get right into some ways to spend whatever money we have left, Kevin. And we'll continue to do it the same way we do it every week. I feel like it's like a pinky in the brain situation. So what are we going to do this week? Same thing we do every week. Go category by category, figure out where we can spend our fab dollars. Kevin, power, home runs, RBIs. Who is still out there that we might want on our teams for the last two weeks? We helped all. So one thing that we do need to consider is the fact that there are two weeks left. There are most teams have either, like you mentioned, they either have 12 games or 13 games left on the docket and you don't have a lot of money left. So I think what should also be in consideration, yeah, there are two fab periods, but we need to also be considering that whoever we bid on this week has a good shot of just being on your roster the rest of the way. And so just something to keep in mind as you're considering how much money to spend, where to spend it. But Either way, whatever direction you want to go here, Kevin, I need power. That's all I need. Who am I looking at? In 12-team leagues and less, Ryan O'Hearn is is probably still available. And versus right-handed pitching, he is the cleanup hitter for the team with the best record in the American League on a daily basis. He is only 41% rostered in 12-team online championships. He is 100% rostered in 15-team main events. Baltimore has seven games this week. All of them look to be against right-handed starters. So that's where I'm starting. I'm looking for Ryan O'Hearn in 12 teams and less. And in deeper leagues, and if Ryan O'Hearn is not available or underneath him in my waterfall bid, Chris Bryant's back, a couple of home runs, back-to-back games. Now Colorado is on the road this week. Chris Bryant is one of the few, and especially since he hasn't been playing in Colorado all season long. He's been missing a lot of time. Maybe the change isn't going to affect him as much. He's actually rostered in more 12-team leagues than 15-team leagues on the NFPC format right now. Only 30% rostered in main events, but 40% rostered in 12-team online championships. So he would be my backup spot. And even if I, if, if I really need power, I would consider trying to get both of these guys, right? We're, we're really done with stashes other than four, one week. If I really need power and I can get both of these guys and I'm using Ryan O'Hearn this week while Baltimore has seven games versus right-handed pitching and then have Chris Bryant available the following week when Colorado is at home for the final week of the season, that's ideal. And you can cut absolutely anybody that you do not think that is going to be in your lineup at some point over the next two weeks at this point in the season. Yeah, absolutely. Worth mentioning that, yeah, Colorado is on the road all this week. Next week, they are at home to finish out the season with six games in Colorado, seven games in Colorado. They seven. do have a double yeah. header against the Dodgers on that Tuesday of the final week. Something that should be noted when we would have gotten to that in any way in the in, in a f- future section. But worth bringing up here that, especially on that Chris Bryant option, can get those extra play, that extra playing time in Colorado 
as long, uh, assuming he can stay healthy for that long to do that. All right, we need some speed, Kevin. Get off the bats. We don't care. We just want to get on base. We want to get to second base after that. Who's out there stealing some bases and like nobody cares? Bryce Terang. Uh, I think he has five stolen bases over the past couple of scoring periods. So he's getting them in bulk for us. And that's what we're really looking for if we need to push. He is 91% rostered in 15 team main events, but only 26% in the 12 team online championships. Pretty readily available out there in 12 teamers. Four of the seven games that Milwaukee plays this week are versus righties, and he typically does not start versus righties. But on two occasions this past week, and we've talked about this before, teams start doing this more and more down the stretch when they are in contention. Defensive replacements and pinch runners at the end of games, and he did that in two of the games he did not start this past week already, and it's only Friday as we're recording. So he doesn't even necessarily have to start to get in the game, possibly get a stolen base, and then a hopefully a run scored for us. So if it's speed we're after in the shallower leagues and, and a handful of the deeper leagues, Bryce Terang, Seattle faces four left-handed starters this week. So I'd be looking at either Sean Haggerty or I always say Sean, Sam Haggerty, excuse me, Sam Haggerty or Dylan Moore as well who both play more often versus left-handed starters with Seattle facing four of them this week. That, that'd that be in the deeper leagues. I'd, I'd rather have Bryce Terang if available. Yeah, that, that's, that's fair. He's got the more direct route to regular playing time coming up. I keep wanting to keep looking at John Rojas over in Philadelphia, who's he's now played in center field the last three days straight, mixing and matching of lefties and righties with Brandon Marsh moving over to left field for once, but sitting twice against the lefties. Not sure what Philly's schedule looks like going up. Now I'm pulling that up real quick. Going into next week, it does look like they got Atlanta and the Mets. Atlanta should throw out at least one lefty at them while the Mets also throw out two lefties at them. So they he could get some extra playing time there. And he's also the type of guy that we talk about that will get you stolen bases off the bench on top of that as well. So Rojas in, in Philadelphia would be somebody I'm eyeballing and they do have Philadelphia has the full seven game slate as well. So if that's where you're, if that's where your eyes are at, he can run. That's what he does. And he has a better chance of getting on base than, than Paris does in Anaheim, at least <laughs> from recent stats. All right. Like I said, we have some opportunity to talk about here. Let's just look at this coming week schedule. Half the league does play a full seven-day work week with Baltimore, Cleveland, Detroit, Oakland, Atlanta, the Mets, Philadelphia, Washington, Milwaukee, St. Louis, and the Dodgers all getting seven games in seven days. No doubleheaders for next week. We do have the doubleheader with the Dodgers and Colorado in Colorado the following Tuesday so something to keep in mind only one team this week has the two the dreaded two day off week that's Arizona they're off Monday and Thursday the other half of the league they're off either Monday or Thursday so we'll see if there are any rainouts that affect that but as of right now that's what we're looking at Kevin so with that schedule in mind any other matchups that you may have looked at who, who looks like they could take advantage of the situation at hand moving forward for this week? It's not as much the schedule, it, and it is a little bit, because San Francisco is not the one team that only has five games this week. That would be taken into consideration. They do have six, but Luis Matos is one of two players that played every game for San Francisco this week. Tyro Estrada being the other so he's getting in there and over the three levels, double A, triple A, Major League Baseball this season, 510 plate appearances, 14 home runs, 18 stolen bases. Uh, he does hit at the bottom of the order, although versus lefties, he moves up a bit, not to the leadoff spot. That would be amazing, but he has moved up in the lineup a bit versus lefties, but he's just going to be out there. San Francisco, after being absolutely horrid for about a month or a little over as a team offensively, has come around recently. So even at the bottom of the order, hopefully we get that fourth plate appearance each game and the runs and RBI, the county stats will be there. And for him, on a per game basis, they have been there this season. He's only 30% rostered in main events, 16% in online championships. So if, if you're looking for a guy that's being run out there every day, 
which a lot of us are looking for that right now. Matos uh, has been o- over the past week or so. It is a rare sight to see in the Giants lineup to see the same names every single day. And you're <laughs> right. Matos has been out there for the last, what, 10 games straight since getting called back up from AAA. He was playing every day leading up to his demotion as well, at least for the week pri- week leading off. They also faced like four straight lefties before that as well. So I'm not sure if that played a role in that situation at that time, but they've only faced the two lefties or three lefties out of the 10 that he's been back for. So played every single one, like you said. So Luis Matos, nice call out there. Did lead off for one of those games, pretty much batting ninth. But yeah, that was versatile. I was really hoping that might stick and there'd be more lefties coming up, but I'm not... I'm not counting on that. Yeah, he bit, yeah, he didn't go up to the top of the lineup, but he did go up to fifth against right. the other lefties. We'll see what happens there. All right, let's get some pitching out of the way. It's does it's not getting any easier, but we still need wins and Ks. We're still chasing them. In a lot of the a lot of leagues, this might be the tightest or the easiest way to gain any kind of advantage in your standings is in wins and strikeouts, especially toward the, the top, like the top third of your of the pitch of those category standings so kevin if we're chasing these things we most likely are who's out there that you think has a has some good matchups up there they can take advantage of yeah the two oakland starters that will get two starts this seven game week are both appealing to me jp sears and paul blackburn they're both close to 100 percent rostered in 15 team leagues both over 90 percent but available in some spots J.P. Sears available in a little over 40% of 12-teamers and Blackburn available in two-thirds of 12-teamers. They are at home for two starts. We know that's great. Oakland's a great ballpark for pitching. They're versus Seattle and Detroit. Now, what is intriguing to me here, I I think, is that in general, I think most of us would probably rather have jp sears in a vacuum over paul blackburn however as as crazy as this sounds we might have to be careful with this detroit lineup versus lefties uh through the month of september they have been the best team in baseball as far as ops goes against left-handed pitching so that might make me lean paul blackburn here especially with him being more widely available in, in 12 teamers just something to keep in mind with those two. But with both starts being in Oakland, we're probably not too concerned about too many home runs being given up. And then in deeper leagues, Alec Marsh in Kansas City. Now, his last couple of games, he has had an opener, which I would actually welcome if I'm throwing him out there. And we've talked about this all season long little better chance for a win Kansas City's got a pretty nice schedule for him and we know the strikeouts can be there with Alec Marsh also the walks can be there so we got to be a little careful but they get Cleveland this week and then he's set up to to pitch at Detroit and then get the New York Yankees back at Kaufman on the final weekend of the season so a really nice schedule for Alec Marsh there especially if they continue to use an opener for him. But regardless, I do see them using him on these on, on this schedule for four days rest. They are planning to get bulk innings out of him, whether he is the starter or they use an opener for him. Fair enough. I'll give a shout out to Cal Quantrill, who has a two-step. Half of his opponents are in the green and the other half in the red. So, of course, he starts off with Kansas City on Monday, either goes Saturday or Sunday at the end of the week versus Baltimore. So it's not, I want to say it's nice that Baltimore will be on the road, but I actually would rather let, see him pitch in Baltimore in, in that ballpark at the time. But Cal Quantrill readily available two starts. If you need the volume, there are definitely going to be worse options out there. 81% roster in the main event, 35% rostered in our listener leagues, but only 17% rostered in the online championships. Those other 12 teamers on the NFBC platform. So should be readily available there if you need to put another name on your waterfall bids for that type of volume. Don't overlook him. He's boring. He could volume his way into extra strikeouts, but he also can put himself in a situation where he comes out of that week with two wins regardless. All right, let's get to the ratios then, Kevin. If you're able to chip away at this late in the game at ERA or WHIP, or at least want to tread some water, I'll, a, a quick shout out I'll throw out here is Gibson Long, readily available 
everywhere still. He's got a nice. He, he's lined up to face Oakland. Only the one start. If he had two starts, I would have named. I would have put him in the wins and K's. But with Detroit, wins are always going to be a question mark, regardless. And you don't know how he's going to go. And I'm really just riding off of Nick Pollock's coattails here. So he's been talking about him quite a bit in both his his streams over at playback.tv slash pitcher list. And then in his he's the streamer of the day going into the going into Saturday as well. Hopefully by the time you're listening to this, he'll have already started on Saturday and completed that start. Hopefully that turned out average because I don't really want him to make enough of a name for himself where I can't throw $2 at him and, and, and get him pretty much everywhere against Oakland for next week. But yeah, Sawyer Gibson Long, nice start throw. He's got a nice repertoire. He's He, he seems to be sequencing really well. And again, I am just echoing everything that Nick's been talking about. So just make sure you listen to Nick <laughs> on this regard. Who else is out there, Kevin, that can either, like I said, at least allow you to tread water in these ratio categories? I think... In, in many cases, at this time of year, it may not be as much that we're trying to improve as we're just trying to stabilize. Yes. And most <laughs> league formats are some type of rule of having active players in your starting lineup of some sort. So if you're good to go in wins and Ks, then, then we really want to fill our lines up, lineups up with with relievers. And one, even if they get blown up, it's going to be for an inning or less. It's probably not going to – they're not going to leave them out there to let them continue to get blown up. And when we you have a guy not. like – yeah. So if I'm looking good in wins and Ks, and in a couple of my leagues I am, right, most of my leagues, right, 85 or so wins is probably leading the league in the win category uh, it, when I was looking earlier today, that's barely over three wins a week that teams are getting. So if you have a six or seven win lead over the person behind you and you're not either you're in first place in wins or you're not going to catch the person in front of you, it doesn't take a lot to protect that lead. Now I'm not saying you only throw your two best starters out there and expect them to get wins. You're still going to throw four or five, but we can throw an extra reliever or two in there just to stabilize the ratios and protect them. And in that case, there's, there's a plethora of guys, right? And one of the guys that we've talked about quite a bit early in the season, we haven't talked about him as much recently. Ryan Presley has been healthy and been getting his saves over the second half of the year after a couple of stumbling blocks early. So Brian Abreu is one of the guys of the many that I like. His ERA is under two now for two consecutive seasons. He has 125 innings over the past two seasons of a 194 ERA. And he's actually going to help a little bit in strikeouts as well. If you're protecting that while trying to protect your ratios, 178 strikeouts and 125 innings over the past two seasons. So this is the kind of guy I'm looking for to fill in my roster to make sure I have a legal starting lineup if I'm okay in wins. Yeah, I think it's worth speculating for this specific situation that you're talking about with Houston. Presley, yeah, he's pretty much gotten back on track. He did lose the no hit bid or at least yeah. the, the combined no hitter <laughs> in a non save situation, which was disappointing for those of us who just wanted Presley to go through the inning clean, regardless of history and all that. Uh, but I would worry, I would wonder how much they, how much Dusty Baker and them actually sit Presley down the stretch, knowing, knowing that they're going to need him in the playoffs at, peak performance they're still fighting for the al west no, that's not even that's not close to being clinched right now they're in a, they're still a three-team race texas is still in it obviously we see what seattle's been doing and houston right there as well so maybe this is all for nothing but these are situations that i think that you really need to take into consideration when looking at filling your roster with these types of players like you're talking about kevin so i think bobby Bray is a perfect example of that because you're doing it for one reason, and you, but there's definitely a path in which you could see him getting, he vulturing a save or two, or just being used more often 
than he maybe would have if Presley was already at peak performance. Look at those situations, and and if you're looking for one of those plethora of relievers that Kevin was just talking about, consider the situations in which maybe there's a team that's pretty much locked up what they're going for. Look at the Dodgers situation, look at Atlanta's situation, and then maybe there's an opportunity for just more playing time, maybe an extra outing, just one extra outing, one extra inning. Maybe they push them an inning and two thirds instead of one inning because they can and they need to give the rest of the team a little bit more of a breathing, more breathing space. Yeah, absolutely. gratterall has been great. And you mentioned the Dodgers situation uh, as you're talking about it. He's been absolutely amazing. I feel like I, I know it's not the case, but I, I feel like he's been in my lineup for every one of his four wins. He hasn't been, but it just seems <laughs> like just he, he's all they use him in high leverage situations, right? Right. So he's going to be out there when there's that opportunity is, is out there. It doesn't mean that you get lucky enough to also be using him in his lineup every time. Yeah. But it's nice when all of a sudden you blink, you're like, oh, that's right. I did put him in yeah, there. That's there's nice. a win. That's, we'll take it. <laughs> All right, well, we're chasing wins, but sometimes the wins come to us. They come to- <laughs> <laughs> it's always nice. Put that on a shirt, Kevin. Saves are the final category here. We're still chasing these as well. We talked about Chris Martin as an obvious target to be bidding on if this is the area in which you need to go after. We talked about Trevor May being available in select leagues there, here or there. Who else is out there that is getting more saves than we thought, at least last week? Yeah, the other one, another fairly obvious one, Julianne Merriweather. I think most are in agreement that he's probably the guy in Chicago with Alzale out. Fulmer did get a save, but Merriweather had pitched a couple of days prior. And also, I think I think it was a one or two out save even where he came in the middle of the inning when things were starting to get a little rough. So it it, it is possible. They do have a, a couple of other guys that are uh, possibilities to be used in save situations. But I think most agree that it's probably Julianne Merriweather that will get most of the opportunities and he's available almost everywhere. 19% of main event leagues did have him already rostered, but other than that, he's available out there. Yeah. And Fulmer had just come back from the IL and you're absolutely right. Merriweather had played, pitched, I think three straight games, at least two and 20, he threw 20 pitches the day prior. Fulmer came in and threw, yeah, threw the 15 pitches. Neither one of them have pitched since unless they're pitching right now and I'm not paying attention. And I would hope they would have both pitched by the time everybody's listening to this on Sunday, but at least they had a whole week off to get right and we'll have more clarity if we don't already have it by the time Sunday night rolls around. Jose Alvarado still out there. If he's still out there in your league, he's worth a spec as the Phillies are in that similar situation as I talked about earlier. He did get a save a while ago. He also got a loss most recently as Kimbrell also got another loss as he allowed the the ghost runner to, to score in the extra inning game on Tuesday. But Neither one of them have pitched since as well. So still, Jose Alvarado is going to do you more good than harm if you, again, need a, need one of those fillers that Kevin talked about in the ratio categories. And it seems as though the Phillies are going to mix and match down the last two weeks, maybe based on lineup, maybe based on opponent, maybe just based on the feelings <laughs> at the time of the game. Alvarado is going to, again, do you more good than harm anyway. All right, we still have our wild card section here. Of course, we are not stashing. There's two weeks. Come on. (laughs) But Kevin, if if, if you're throwing any kind of random dart of a flare that didn't fit into any category that we talked about already, who could that dart be going toward? I'm stashing for the weekend before I've actually bid on anybody to stash. Pete Crow Armstrong for the Chicago Cubs. Not off to a a quick start, but it's only been two games. And so eight plate appearances, no hits. I want to see what happens over the weekend. I really want to see the playing time. I think the assumption was this was the end of Michael Talkman's run. Michael Talkman back in the lineup, in the leadoff spot, in center field versus a righty on Friday night. That's a situation where we expect to see Pete Crow Armstrong in the lineup. 
I, I almost feel like this is probably uh, he's hitless in his first two games. All right, let's sit, have a breather. Uh, we'll put, we'll put Talkman back out there and we, we probably see uh, Pete Crow Armstrong versus right-handed pitching over the weekend. If that's the case, then I'm probably depending on my needs and in certain leagues, then uh, I'll make a bid on him on Sunday evening. If it continues to sit over the weekend, especially versus righties, then I probably don't have much interest, but I, I am fairly confident that we are going to see him against righties. We'll see how it goes over the weekend. That's the only reason I put him in as a wild card is we've only seen the lineup for three games since he's arrived and him not being in the lineup versus a righty on Friday does bring some questions up. So I want to see a little more over the weekend. Yeah, of course, we didn't talk about Pete Crow Armstrong in the start of the show in the news section because I wanted to give you an opportunity to throw somebody into this section. That's <laughs> that's the reason. Now, I'm glad you brought him up. Obviously, another one of the bigger name prospects to get the call this week, again, of, of course, by the Cubs this time around. I can't wait to see who we're talking about in this area next week. Who's going to get the call for the <laughs> final week of the season? You know what? There's seven games left. You're not playing minor league ball anymore. There's no more season. Just come on up here. Maybe it'll be the Cubs again. Maybe the Cubs will call up Ben Brown like we talked about if he's not hurt or Kate Horton or somebody else in that realm. I, if it's going to be anybody, it's going to be a pitcher, right? It, I think for the final week, it'll be like a spot start or what have you. So. I'm interested I would to see think who so. we're talking the, the about. The lower levels of the minors have already ended, but mm-hmm. now double A AA and triple A seasons are coming to an end, and even some playoffs are will be finishing up over the next few days. And so anybody that especially teams not in contention, anybody they want to see a few more plate appearances out of or a couple more innings pitched, we still may see them over the last two weeks. Yeah, it'll be fun to watch, and we'll watch every single inning of of all that. And then you'll get to see it even more when they get to extend their season into Arizona Fall League going after. The season for the Fall League starts in October, though, right? It doesn't start right after the, the end, end the tail of the end MLB of regular season. They get going. Yeah. Is, did they schedule first pitch again to do during the home run derby? Did you get to do that again? Yeah, and they actually adjusted. They actually changed the the times and and days of the home run derby and fall stars game again, like they did last year, due to possible conflict with World Series games. Mm-hmm. Because game seven of the World Series could be Saturday evening, so they moved the home run derby to late Saturday afternoon, early evening, and then. The man. fall stars game till Sunday, oh, just man. like they did last year, because uh, games six and seven of the World Series, if necessary, will be the Friday and Saturday evenings of first pitch Arizona. <laughs> oh, it, it, yeah, it's horrible. It's a horrible time. Adam. Yes, it's- <laughs> I appreciate you, my friend. All right, on that note. I think that's going to wrap it up for episode 132. Kevin, is there any other final notes though, that you want to throw out there again, two weeks left. What else is there to, what else is there to say? Real quick. You brought up at the very beginning of the episode, a little more time on the leagues where you're in contention. When you're looking at the categories, don't just look at the, the numbers. Also look at who they are, Right. Some of the guys, if a player that you're trying to protect against is one of the players that has stopped since football started last week, changing their lineup, you don't have to worry about them. Right? You can take a little deeper look at not just the numbers of each category, but exactly who is it in the standings in each category that it is that is right in front or right behind you. Just dig a little deeper. Yeah, you might not have to fight as hard. If who's above you, or you might see an opportunity where 12 runs is a lot in a week, but, oh, but this guy isn't changing his lineup. Maybe I can actually make that up. Yeah. You don't. Yeah. If you're up 12 or you're down 12, you probably need more than 12 unless the person who is above you isn't doing anything. (laughs) That's fair. All right. That on that note is going to wrap it up for episode 132 of on the wire. You can follow myself on the Twitter at 80 grade. That's all spelled out. Kevin is at Hasten Kevin. Of course, follow the pod itself at On The Wire Pod. After all that, I am Adam Howe. On behalf of Kevin Hasten, thanks for listening, and we bid you goodbye. Goodbye.